And we are live on Facebook and YouTube. People that are on Facebook, feel free. We'll put a link below to the live back and forth conversation via YouTube so you can actually see Evan's pretty face. And let's dig in, Evan. How are we doing, man? Pretty good. Good morning. Good morning to you. Yes, sir. So you mentioned uh, joint pain or I mentioned joint pain. You said, okay, let's hit it. This is a fun one. We could go many, many directions. Where do you want to start with joint pain? Yeah, so let's talk about kind of the pathophysiology regarding joint issues. So a couple underlying causes, right? Joint issues typically can be caused by a wear and tear. And that wear and tear can be excessive exercise induced. It can be excessive or not enough building blocks to help your body heal and recover. So you're providing a stimulus. That stimulus is exercise. Exercise causes your body to break down, and then your body then shifts at night and goes anabolic to heal back up. But if you don't have enough building blocks on board, nutrition, protein, amino acids, collagen, you're not going to have that piece building back up as much. Uh, number three is going to be chemical. So a lot of joint issues these days are going to be autoimmune in nature. So the more we have gluten in our diet, the more we have inflammation in our diet, we can actually start breaking down our tissue via an autoimmune mechanism. So there's a couple different ways that our joints can be affected. Again, wear and tear, a lack of nutrition, as well as number three is going to be an autoimmune mechanism that's affecting how the body is attacking itself and then breaking itself down, not via stress like exercise stress, but internal chemical immune stress. So what do you, what do you what's your what's your comment when someone says, "Oh, I'm just getting old. That's why my joints hurt." What do you say to that? Well, it's a cop out, right? People say that they're getting old and that's the reason why they're having their issues is because what does age do? Age magnifies bad habits, okay? Now, obviously at some point a 90-year-old's not going to be the same as a 20-year-old, but there are lots of people who have they has they have they gotten into their 50s and 60s and 70s? you know, if they were unhealthy in their 30s and 40s, actually become healthier and healthy. And there's lots of examples of that, Jack LaLanne for one. And there's lots of healthy people that are have really taken care of themselves and pushed themselves up to the next level that have made a big difference. But age magnifies bad habits. Also, all stress summates, it accumulates, right? This is called allostatic load. So we have like our metaphorical stress bucket, right? This is my little coffee mug. All your little stress balls go into that bucket, right? Those stress balls could be gluten, they could be poor sleep, they could be work stress, they could be um, low adrenal levels, hypothyroidism, leaky gut, low stomach acid, malabsorption, all these things could be present regarding kind of your allostatic load. And when these little stress balls overflow, this is where your body starts to break down and symptoms occur. So the goal is we're trying to number one, make our stress bucket bigger right? We do that through healthy diet and lifestyle. And then we also remove the stressors as well. Removing the stressors, avoiding the bad foods, having the healthy lifestyle and, and diet habits. Those are going to be really important to start with. What do you think? Yeah, well, and we know that stomach acid, which we love talking about, stomach acid drops with age. So it could say, oh, it so you could say that yes, age technically could lead to joint pain if it's going to lead to malabsorption issues. So we do have to supplement with HCL. I think that is an important part of joint pain and preventing that as you get older is you got to make sure you're actually getting your amino acids and your glycine and your cysteine and your proline and all these other things that you get from food. And especially if you're doing like a bone broth, I think that could be a good strategy too. If you're aging, even if you're not aging, I, I drink bone broth in some shape or form on a weekly basis. So you've got to make sure you're getting the raw materials because no matter how good the diet is, if you can't absorb anything, it's just a waste of money. And then obviously there's other issues too. I mean, should we mention infections, for example? I mean, you and I discussed this a couple of years ago when my wife was having migrating joint pain throughout her wrist and ankles and elbows and all that, and she had mycoplasma pneumonia infection. We found that. We found that on a comprehensive infection panel. We found mycoplasma. Mycoplasma is a really big driver potentially of arthritic issues, rheumatoid arthritis. It can affect you know the immune system, and it can also go after the joints. And there's antibiotics like minocycline that treat that, but we use some herbal formulas. We use reishi and cat's claw and a couple other herbal formulas to help knock it out. And within a month or two, she was much better with the joint issues, wasn't she? Oh, yeah. I mean, she was yeah. waking up. For example, she was 25 at the time. She was waking up, just for folks listening, and putting on her bracelet or putting on a watch really? was causing pretty severe pain. Now, luckily, we looked and we looked and we looked for Lyme, and we did not find Lyme. 
So that's good, but that could be tied in with that because sometimes you're going to get a Lyme infection and you're going to get the uh, mycoplasma or other issues. So you've got to rule in or rule out infections too. Now that's something to me, it's, I wouldn't say it's rare, but it's less common than other issues like malabsorption, parasite issues, bacterial problems that are going to cause more joint pain. Totally. I'm adding it right here live because we are just like functional medicine improv. So I'm letting everyone know the topic is joint pain of today in case that people came in late. So we're talking about joint pain. So I agree, right? You mentioned the stomach acid thing. Dr. Jonathan Wright's talked about this too. Stomach acid goes down as you age. Now, again, stress also affects stomach acid, right? Diet's going to affect stomach acid. The more inflammatory your food is, the more that's going to affect how your body makes stomach acid. When you have low stomach acid, you have low enzymes. Now, people forget to make healthy bones. What do you need? Half your bones, what? Half your bones, protein. The other half of your bones is going to be about 13 different minerals. The most common one that everyone knows is going to be calcium, right? But again, Protein's half of that bone. So if we can't break down healthy protein sources, we're really going to have a hard time producing healthy bone and keeping ourselves in a kind of equilibrium regarding our calcium deposit levels, which is, you know, our mineral levels in the bone. So healthy protein is really important. The other half is going to be minerals. This is where the, the minerals are really important. And with the minerals, we also need healthy stomach acid levels because we need ionized minerals to happen. So we ionized minerals are nothing more than hydrochloric acid hitting that mineral and then it ionizes which means it can kind of kind of um infiltrate or kind of be um kind of go into a soluble state in the blood so it can be transferred and absorbed and utilized by the body if it's not ionized it's just kind of like a rock you got to break that rock down so it can be utilized in its constituents yep. so hydrochloric acid is important for the protein aspect of the bone but it's also important for the ionization of those minerals that make up the other half and again the most common one's going to be calcium but there are other ones there as well so let's chat about the conventional approach to joint pain. Most of the time, if you have joint pain, let's say you go into the doctor's office or for example, like me, when I was working at UPS in college, I hurt my back. I went to their doctor and they said, oh, here's a strong NSAID and here's a muscle relaxer. Good luck. And this is what's going to happen. You're going to get Tylenol. You're going to get some type of over-the-counter medication that's got potentially some very serious side effects. I mean, there's what you and I've discussed this number before 18,000 people dying a year from just standard dose of is it aspirin was it Advil which one was it ibuprofen Tylenol? yeah that, that's New, New England Journal of Medicine 1999 Wolf et al 19,900 die a year of ibuprofen taken properly so we've got kidney we've got liver damage that could occur from all of this and once again it's not going to address the root cause. So then if you get into the more joint pain issues, you could potentially get into painkillers. I've had many female clients that whether it was autoimmune in nature or not, they were dealing with joint pain and the doctor ends up putting them on some type of opioid. Uh, I had a totally. woman actually last week who was on, uh, what's it called? Hydrocodone, like 15 milligrams of hydrocodone. And I got five milligrams after that major 12-year uh, molar surgery. So she's on triple the amount of that. Oh, my Lord. Yeah, the conventional modalities for joint pain issues really aren't good. So number one, there's treating the symptoms. So that's the pain. So you're going to have drugs like your ibuprofen. You maybe even have more severe drugs like your COX-2 inhibitors like Vioxx, et cetera. What these do is these affect the cyclooxygenase enzymes, which are enzymes that help with pain, that help convert that pain signal to the brain but they also help with gut lining, stomach lining, heart issues. So if we don't have that healthy enzyme, we can't build healthy heart and healthy gut lining. And it also can create a lot of stress on the liver and it can even reduce glutathione levels. So when we're taking in medications like an ibuprofen, for instance, we're gonna be reducing glutathione. Now aspirin tends to be a little, baby aspirin tends to, tends to be a little bit safer, much better off using herbs that tend to have a modulatory effect and essentially aren't going to de or down regulate, deregulate your detoxification pathways via glutathione. So that's kind of one aspect. The next is you have your corticosteroid medication. So when it becomes more painful, right, prednisone, corticosteroids, which actually will increase osteoclastic activity. Little osteoclasts break down the bones, osteoblasts build up. So B for blast equals builder, C for class is breaking down, right? Think of catabolic as C for class is catabolic. It's breaking down. So 
again, those medications, those steroid types of medications are actually going to make the problem worse. Again, they work great on the actual symptom in the moment, but they're not going to be the best for fixing the underlying issue. And then the last, we talked about one, two, three, this is the third one, is we have medications like Boniva or Fosamax, which will increase osteoblastic activity. The problem is it kind of does it in a haphazard form. So you get more thickening of bone, but you don't have it in a strengthening kind of tensile alignment. So you have more bone, but the bone is weaker. And again, there was a big issue down in Florida a few years back where these dentists were seeing kind of people's jaw bones like rotting. Like they were doing dental work and they were going in there to like, you know, address some of the tooth issues via the jaw. And it was just the jaw was crumbling away with some of these elderly patients that were on these medications. So again, big problems there because it's the goal wasn't just to have thicker bones. The goal is to have thicker, stronger, functional bones that you can actually, you know, put stress on and, and create a healthy lifestyle by walking and hiking and doing all the things that you want in your life. That is unbelievable. So that those drugs were just destroying people they were just whittling away exactly yep 100 percent smokes mm -hmm. now um I, we we should also mention vitamin d too right because we've got this connection with vitamin d and we've got vitamin k the interaction there we've got calcium regulation with that so you really 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 want to have optimal vitamin d levels especially if you've had any history of osteoarthritis because if you've got vitamin d levels that are low there's tons of research linking that. So you've got to have it, I say minimum 60, but you know, we could say up to what, 80 maybe in some cases is okay for vitamin D? I would say up to even 100 if you have an autoimmune issue. I'd say 50 to 100, and 50 would kind of be okay if you don't have an active autoimmune issue, up to 100 if you have an active autoimmune issue for sure. Okay. Did you want to, and did you want to mention anything else about that? Like why vitamin D is so important? For this? Yeah. Vitamin D, what it's going to do is it's going to increase the absorption of phosphorus and calcium, which are important building blocks, mineral building blocks for the bone. When, when vitamin D is higher, what it does is it decreases phosphorus excretion and it increases calcium absorption up to 200%. So vitamin D helps, but vitamin D helps calcium go from the gut into the blood, the bloodstream. And you know what's cool? It can go around. Go ahead. You know, I was going to say, you know what's cool is at the very bottom of the organic acids, the phosphoric acid number, most of the time, if I see that low number 75 on there, if somebody happened to have their blood work done, like 99% of the time, low phosphoric acid on there correlates with low vitamin D. Yeah. Makes really sense. Cool. Vitamin D works on phosphorus absorption and calcium absorption. So that totally makes sense. Now, if we keep on diving into, um, Hormones are really important, especially if you're a female and you're in that menopausal age. Estrogen and progesterone are really important for building healthy bones. Progesterone helps with osteoblastic activity. That's the builders. And it helps – and estrogen helps with osteoclastic activity. C for clastic equals C for catabolic or breaking down. We need a healthy bit because if we don't – if we don't break down old bone and put new bone back, we don't have healthy, strong bone there. So there needs to be this balance of, of give and take, push and pull, break down, build up that's happening in the body. So we have hormones have a major impact on it. So if you're a female and you're estrogen dominant or if you're a menopausal female and then your ovaries aren't really working as well and you're relying more on your adrenals and your estrogen dominant or your hormones are just low altogether, we need healthy hormone levels to help build bones as well. Got it. So if you've got infections, therefore you probably got some adrenal problems, you could potentially have some issues with joint pain just based on that. And if you have an infection, that's going to affect malabsorption, leaky gut. And if you have a mycoplasma infection, right, like your wife did, yep. that can create that autoimmune kind of molecular mimicry uh, thing going on that kind of mimics RA or rheumatoid arthritis, which is joint pain, which is typically bilateral presentation. It happens on both sides where osteoarthritis, which is the wear and tear thing we mentioned, that typically happens unilateral, one side or the other. So RA, both sides of the body, both hips, both knees, where osteoarthritis is kind of a more wear and tear, which tends to be more unilateral, one side only. Ah, well said. Yeah, and people listen with like a relaxed ear until this actually affects you, and then you're going to be listening frantically to this, but when that hit my wife, I mean, it happened quick. I told you it was over like a week, like one day she woke up and then boom, there was a joint pain and it was just intense. So this, this stuff is real and it could hit at an unexpected time and you got to know what root causes can you look for. So absolutely. You, 
you were super helpful. You're like, man, look, we've got to get this, this test here. It's probably co-infections. Boom. You were spot on once again. Yeah. And we called it, man. I was so happy to see that. Yeah. So let's, um, let's hit a couple other questions here. Cause I think they're really pertinent to the conversation. So a couple of things regarding exercise, exercise creates a piezoelectric effect, which basically creates a magnet for calcium attaching to the bone. So exercise is helpful, but if you already have osteoporosis, you got to be careful because there's a wear and tear thing that's happening where you may create more wear from the exercise and not get enough build back up from the calcium and that piezoelectric effect. So you got to make sure the hormones and the nutrition and the extra building blocks are there to help that calcium and those minerals take effect. So collagen is going to be super important. When there's osteoporosis, 60 to 80 grams a day, daily. Um, calcium, I mean, if they're a female, for sure, it just regularly, typically we'll recommend a couple hundred micrograms like a calcium malate in a good quality multi. If there's building block issues, we'll give some extra calcium for sure. Uh, we'll also make sure there's vitamin K2 along with that. We'll also make sure there's some magnesium along with that as well. Strontium is also good. Um, so those are really important. We'll modulate estrogen levels and progesterone, but that's going to be specific to the patient. And then after that, um, natural things to help reduce inflammation, fish oil is going to be great. You know, up to eight to 10 grams a day is going to be fine. We just have to make sure it's high quality fish oil in a triglyceride form and we take some extra antioxidants so we can stabilize the cell membrane so we don't get lipid peroxidation. Lipid peroxidation is basically fish oil is a polyunsaturated fat. Polyunsaturated fats can go and oxidize very easily because they have a double bond between the two carbons. Double bond makes the fat more unstable, where a saturated fat has all of the hydrogens uh, attached to the carbon in single bonds. So this is just you know, organic chemistry 101. More single bonds equal more stable fat. More double bonds in between the carbons equal a more unstable fat and can oxidize easier. So we take in extra vitamin C or extra vitamin E or extra curcumin to help stabilize those um, those polyunsaturated fats getting in there. So if somebody smells their fish oil and it's very smelly, let's say it's a inferior ethyl ester form, can we assume that that's going to be creating more oxidation there? They're already going to be taking like a fully oxidized fish oil, therefore making the problem even worse. Exactly. So we want to make sure it's a triglyceride form. A lot of the fish oils like my omega-3 supreme actually has lipase in it because we kind of make the assumption that most people we're seeing have compromised digestion. Yep. So we want to ensure that that fat is getting broken down optimally. And you know, we'll up some antioxidants. So my line will give vitamin C synergy or curcumin supreme to help provide stabilization of the cell membrane. Perfect. There was a question about vitamin K. We mentioned it already, but they were hearing that the calcium, vitamin D, and vitamin K should be taken together. I personally, unless it's in a blend of something, I personally never use calcium, um, but the vitamin D and K, I, I do use. I use a liquid for that, a vitamin D plus K, K1, yeah. K2. Yeah, I don't use it by itself. It's going to be in a, in a blend for the most part, but with my female menopausal patients or patients that have severe osteoporosis, there's a product that I use called Osteoben has a lot of that in there combined that works very well. It's good. I've used that one. And then also I've used the, I believe it's called Arthroben too. Which yeah. Is well, very yeah. The, that's the collagen peptides. In my line, I use the true collagen, which is yeah. similar, um, which again, we go up to 60 to 80 grams, which is about like four to six scoops a day to really get the building blocks up there for sure. That's a lot of collagen. It is. Yeah, it's about, yeah. I mean, it's what it takes to, to build those bones up. You know, yep. we're trying to give someone a bailout because they're they've been in debt for so long. Absolutely. But again, you know, on average, typically one to two scoops, ten to twenty grams, just for like hair and skin and nails and, and healthy joints is fine as a preventative dose. For sure. Um, if you wanted to hit another question, but I did, I did want to mention there's also topical relief too for um, joint pain. So there's a couple of different creams that I'll use. The Arthrosooth cream is really good. It's got like the peppermint essential oil in there. It's got the MSM. It's got the white willow bark. It's got the, I believe it's got the capsium in there too. Maybe a little bit of tea tree. And there's actually, I think it's called celadan or something like that. There's some type of patented ingredient in there where they've actually studied it and they found that people had increased joint mobility with it. So I use that cream. My grandmother uses it after she gets home or before she goes to play tennis and she's noticed probably 20, 30% improvement. So that's just from the topical perspective. Now, obviously you still got to do the other work, working on yourself internally, ruling in things, ruling out things with infections and such, but there's topical solutions too, right? There's not going to be one silver bullet. It's going to be just a combination of all this stuff in your toolbox, which is what we're hoping to build up with you here today. Yeah. Topical things we can also do is going to be frankincense, essential oil is great. 
or the same version, Boswellia, which is basically frankincense in a capsule form, which is the herb, and you could take that internally. Curcumin, we use liposomal curcumin or curcumin supreme. Um, Systemic-based enzymes taken on an empty stomach like serapeptidase can also help with inflammation too. If it's acute inflammation, how did it happen? Did it happen because you ate gluten or some inflammatory food? Then that's a chemical irritant and we have to just, you know, do the things to help cool down the gut and get the gluten dissolved. If it's a exercise based thing, again, make sure your forms really well. A lot of people, I was a personal trainer for like five years. A lot of people have crappy form when it comes to squatting, lunging, deadlifts, uh, or in their AMRAP cycle of their CrossFit workout, they just do very, you know, they their, their form just goes to hell in a handbasket, right? They push themselves to failure too much where their form breaks down and their, their technique isn't good. They're not having perfect reps. So really making sure those functional movements are stronger. And a lot of people, they're exercising on machines and machines work two, two-dimensionally. And the problem is in the real world, we perform three-dimensionally. So you don't build the stabilization units. You don't have all the stability in the joint that's three-dimensional when you work on machines. So a lot of people essentially develop these big, stupid muscles that don't necessarily work optimally in the real world. Agreed. Yeah. So I injured myself on a shoulder press machine because what had happened is I tried to go too heavy with dumbbells. Yeah. So once I went too heavy, which was already the first mistake, this is when I was probably 19, uh, went too heavy with dumbbells. So then I switched to the shoulder press machine because it allowed me to lift more weight. But that's a tiny little muscle. Your little three different shoulder muscles there, that's a small muscle. It didn't need to be hit with 100, 120 pounds like I was hitting it with. And so I've learned my lesson, and now I just do free weights with it, and I feel much, much better. So the pain that, that I was experiencing there is gone, and that was a yeah. all physically induced. Yep, absolutely. And a lot of people running, for instance, long distance, kind of like your LSD training, long, slow distance training is really going to be probably one of the worst things for you because it's just that repetitive, you know, compression movement over and over and over again, over and over again. And essentially those movements are going to really increase cortisol levels. So then that creates more of that catabolic effect where you're breaking down more of that bone. And then also running form, um, one of the listeners here put in the chat, Form is really important when you run. A lot of people have bad running form. A couple of reasons why. I worked in a biomechanics lab at UMass in college, undergrad, and we had these like different compression force plates. And people would run over the force plates, and we'd see how force is displaced. Now, a lot of people are are heel strikers. So when you're a heel striker, what you're doing is you're hitting the ground, you're hitting the brake, and then rolling over mid mid stride, and then going forward again. So it's like brake gas, brake gas, brake gas. So the whole goal is if you can dial in your strike so you can be at least mid to, to front foot strike, you can like have the effect of running downhill. So really important is go online and, and make sure your form is great when it comes to running. You should have a slight lean and you should be striding so you're, you're hitting to that front half of the foot, not the back half of the foot because that's going to in, com, increase compression forces, which is going to cause more of that wear and tear and that catabolic hormone effect and break down more of that tissue. Yeah, well, and you also want to make sure that you're using a zero drop shoe. Uh, if you have followed the work, which I'm sure our listeners have of uh, Mark Sisson, Mark's Daily Apple or Dr. Mercola, they both were endurance runners. They both did running so much in their life and they Absolutely. destroyed themselves and they are very, very anti long distance running. Now you can read about that, but a zero drop shoe for me was a game changer because a lot of people and you know, probably more about this from a structural standpoint than me, but with a big heel on someone's shoe, you're going to be basically always flexing that calf muscle and then you're messing up your hamstring and then you're messing up your low back. It's like the whole chain gets put off. I had the guy I'm trying to think of his name now. If you typed in like podiatrist, not just paleo, you'd find it. But I had a, a, foot, a foot doctor on the show and he talked about how bad a shoe that's not zero drop is for you. And really that's one of the biggest issues that can lead to bunions and all sorts of like foot problems is the drop of your shoe, which obviously could create joint pain too, back pain, hip pain, knee pain, et cetera. And once I ditched my other shoes and I went to either like a barefoot shoe, like a Vibram, or I've actually got some like zero drop boots that I've been hiking in, oh man, I feel so much better. No more low back pain. I think that's huge. Also, chiropractic care I think is essential because joints need movement. And if we have like subluxated or stuck joints in the spinal column, right, that's going to create inflammation. And again, what's going to happen too is the brain and the spine, the brain, the spine, and the muscle communicate via movements. And if we have subluxation where the joints are 
not aligned properly or they're fixated, they're not moving properly, we have poor communication from the brain to the joint. So again, we can help communication via exercise, but again, therapeutically, healthy chiropractic adjustments specific are gonna be super helpful. Also, if you're a distance runner, making sure your feet are moving properly. There are 26 bones in your feet. And if they aren't moving properly, how you displace force is gonna be severely impaired. So you gotta make sure that part's dialed in. I want to mention the running surface that you're on too. Now that we've kind of gone on this, this other topic, I hate running on concrete. It's terrible. You're not designed to run on hard concrete with rubber insulated shoes. So for totally. me, obviously best case scenario, what your ancestors do and still do hunter gathers today is they're barefoot in dirt. But if you're in Austin or somewhere and you have no idea what's on that trail, somebody could have dropped the razor or a piece of glass or something. Obviously, you don't want to, you know, get yourself caught up with that. But, you know, barefoot's going to be the best or as close to barefoot. And then natural surfaces, so grass, dirt, leaves, sticks, you know, uh, pine needles, those totally. surfaces are way better for you than like running on asphalt or even worse, running on a treadmill. So you've really got to zoom out and look at yourself from a third person perspective. Would your great, 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 great grandfather, if they saw what you were doing, would they say, what the hell are you doing and why are you doing that? If so, then maybe you need to reevaluate what you're doing and calling it exercise. I totally agree. So making sure you have the right exercise dialed in, the right form dialed in, whether it's running or whether it's lifting or resistance training, you know, good chiropractor or a good massage therapist on board to help for sure. Uh, making sure the metabolic stuff's dialed in, right? Diabetes and insulin resistance will also create inflammation and increase your chance of um, bone issues as well, hormone issues, adrenal issues, low stomach acid, low enzyme physiology, infections, the infection connection we see with mycoplasma and other parasites that can create malabsorption. Anything else we missed, Evan? I think we hit everything pretty well. Oh, also, instantaneous pain relief too, which can be helpful. But again, it's got to you got to make sure you're addressing the root cause. So when we talk about palliative things, it has to be done in the context of hey, we're doing this thing that works to help cut pain fast, but we're also fixing the root cause over here. That can also be cryotherapy. Yeah, cryotherapy. I have heard a lot of good, a lot of good stuff about that. Actually, a a client of mine out in California, she went to the place where Joe Rogan was at, and she was like, "I got to meet Joe Rogan in person. He was at the cryo studio, so I knew I was in the right one." I was like, "Yeah, that's cool." Um, also, uh, CBD oil too. So it depends on what state you're in. Obviously, if you're in a legal cannabis state, you can get CBD THC blends because the THC is going to work much better. But if you're in the other states where only CBD is legal, then you can look into either like a liposomal, but just a regular cannabis oil. And if you're at like a 5, 10, or 15 milligram dose of CBD, uh, I've got a female who she's in her 70s and she wants to get back to riding horses and she had all this hip pain. Totally. As soon as she brought in the CBD, she felt better. So obviously like for dosing and for specific brands and stuff, you'd have to reach out to someone uh, like Justin or me. But that is another option that could be over the counter available. And then there's also, if you get like a medical card, you can go get stronger versions that would have THC in there. Totally. And then last but not least too, is making sure your muscles are activated. This is kind of a, it may fly over people's heads, but again, like as a, a chiropractor, you know, I used to be doing a lot of adjusting, which is helpful for getting the joints moving. But also when I was doing more of that type of work, I was looking at muscle activation. So I would go through and touch and test all of the different muscles. So, I mean, I've had experiences where I was working on, um, Olympic level athletes, gold medal sprinters, and we would test their hip flexors and just nothing would be on. Like it would just be like turned off from a neurological facilitation standpoint, it was just totally inhibited. So we weren't getting optimal nerve stimulation. I've tested you know, NFL athletes as well. If we don't have those muscles turned on, muscles are your natural shock absorbers. So there are so many people out there that don't have their muscles and those shocks on. So that force goes into sensitive soft tissue avascular structures. Avascular is a big word for lacking blood flow. So when they break down and they get inflamed, they're so hard to heal because you don't have that good blood supply bringing oxygen, nutrition, and pulling the inflammation out. So making sure the muscles are turned on and get a good applied kinesiology chiropractor. I'll give a uh, shout out to um, Garrett Saulpeter over at NewFit, newfit newfit new.fit over in Austin. He has some great services there where he uses the ARP wave or his newbie and um, and the applied kinesiology type of work to help make sure those muscles are turned back on. That works great. So how do the muscles turn off? 
They're going to turn off because of stress, because of inflammation, uh, because of adhesions or trigger points in the muscle belly, because of poor biomechanics, because of inflammation, because of poor lifestyle habits. Inflammation tends to shut everything down over time. Well, remember for when I was over at your house, you hooked me up to the ARP wave. That thing was yeah. intense. Yeah, yeah, that thing's really awesome because it's basically an inflammation detector. So we can go in there and we can basically shock that inflammation, reduce the inflammation by driving in blood flow. We can also create more efficient neurological patterns by doing correct movements and then also adjusting the joint, which provides more mechanoreceptive, proprioceptive input to the brain and it helps the joint work better for sure. You had me hooked up and you were trying to get me to sit down. It was a struggle. I was like, whoa. Yeah. Who knew? Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, that stuff's awesome, man. I mean, it's like working with um, that type of technology on patients. It's like cheating because you can really hone in your treatment just so specific. And that was what, like ten, fifteen thousand dollar device? Yeah, it's like a fifteen, twenty thousand dollar. I have a couple of them. They're great. They're phenomenal. They were awesome with patients. Wow! Wow! Love them. Anything else we should mention on joint pain? I feel like this was really good coverage. I think we hit everything. I mean, we're we're really hitting everything from a 360 standpoint because I guarantee you there's no podcast out there that's hitting the infection piece no. or um or even a lot of the just the modalities that we hit too. I think we hit a full kind of spectrum for all the different potential solutions that are out there. Well, here's the problem too, is a lot of people are selling on their particular dogma, right? So if they've got a XYZ podcast, they're going to sell people on why their solution is the solution, but that's not really us. I mean, if we're going to tell you that if, it, if it's a chiropractic or applied kinesiology a person could help you, we're going to tell you, we're not going to omit some type of therapy just because it's not something we can offer. And I do see with a lot of other people out there, they're only going to end up at their solution for the problem, but there's other places out there that you can get help. Now, obviously you still, you know, can benefit a lot from working with us with these other deeper issues, the infection connection and all that, but you can't fix everything, you know, with the, with the magic supplements and removing infections. Sometimes you may need that hands-on care. So I agree. And a lot of chiropractors, you know, they get their patients lull into just having adjustments all the time without making any changes. Now, I don't think it's that bad because no one's, you know, 20,000 people aren't dying a year from adjustments. You get maybe one in 10 million that that happens and they yeah. typically already have a pre-existing stroke and that's the reason why it happens. It very rarely happens because of a chiropractic adjustment. So again, if you're seeing a chiropractor and you're not getting to the root cause, well, at least use that time that it's helping to reduce the pain to investigate what the underlying cause is and ideally your chiropractor or physical therapist should be working on all of the diet and lifestyle things as the foundation and then using some of the modalities that we talked about to stack on top of that and then digging in deeper with some of the extra things like the uh, applied kinesiology or the cryo or the supplementation or even the hormones too to help improve uh, bone growth. Isn't that interesting, the link between big pharma and the mass media? I mean, that chiropractor story where someone, you know, I believe there was some type of death last year. I mean, it was all over the media. Yeah. And that was, like you said, one in 10 million. However, you don't hear about the 19,000 that die every year of the ibuprofen. So. No, you don't hear about that at all. And again, that girl, that was a girl was in LA. I think she was a former Miss America or some kind of model. She was a celebrity of some sort. But she got in a car accident. She you know, had whiplash and the car, maybe there was already kind of um, a little tear in the, um, in the uh, lining of the artery. And that adjustment just was enough to throw off a clot and create that issue. So, you know, going back to my old days as a chiropractic physician, I would never adjust anyone osseously, you know, with a kind of the crack sound uh, post car accident. We wow. always do very, more gentle things, more techniques that were more gentle in the beginning, just more or less just to ensure from a liability standpoint, you know, I didn't get caught up in that. Yeah, that's a scary place to be. Oh, yeah. Thinking you're responsible for that. Goodness gracious. Oh, exactly. And the research is pretty clear. Dr. Malik Slosberg's done tons of work on this uh, with about one in 10 million. About you know, the same risk of having a stroke going to a chiropractor, you have the same risk of having a stroke walking into your primary care's office. Same exact risk factor. Wow. That's a trip. Well, yeah. gr great job today. Uh, people can reach out, justinhealth.com, not just paleo.com. We do block out a few hours a month for free calls. So if you need to see if you're a good fit, then you can reach out and we'll see if we can help you out. Evan, great show today, my man. Appreciate it. Loved it. And we're going to be back next week for more info coming your way. Likewise. Take care. Take care, Evan. Okay, bye. Bye.